Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's time for another drive time rant. Yes, it's exactly the same as the last drive time rant. I've just gone a few hundred meters extra, but uh, I thought I would film another one. So here we go. Um, what I want to talk about, not electronics this time, so if you're after electronics, tune out. It's about the blog again, because I get quite a lot of email about um, how the blog actually works, what tools I use, and and uh, you know, and possibly how they can set up their own blog. Well, I'll tell you um, step by step how it works, how a typical blog works, and what tools I used. Now, for starters, I use a uh, Senyo Exacti. Um, HD 1010 um, high definition uh, gun style camcorder it's a it's a really nice instrument it's probably the best value for money HD camcorder on the market it's got great optics it's got reasonably good low light performance um, it's got a 300 frames per second high speed mode and, it, and you can get it for like $400 um, and the equivalent um, HD optics to get anything better really you've got to spend like fifteen hundred dollars or two grand or something like that so really it's a it's a very popular um, video blog camcorder the Sanyo Exacti now for the sound um, if you're going to do a blog the internal microphone is absolute crap um, generally so don't bother get yourself a good external mic now I'm using a uh, Rode video mic which is designed and built by Rode Microphones in Australia and they have, an, they have an awesome industry rep for manufacturing some of the best mics on the market but um, and this one is one of the most highly regarded video low-cost video microphones and I, I picked up mine for like hundred and thirty dollars it's not expensive at all so my whole kit um, is was like you know five hundred and fifty uh, you know let's say five hundred and fifty dollars or something like that um, so it's not a hugely expensive kit by all means and I already had the tripod for my camera and things like that so you know and you can pick up tri tripods for like 20 bucks or something like that they're they're not expensive either so it's not expensive to get some real um, decent quality equipment for video blogging now um, the good thing about the Rode mic is what I'm doing now um, it, it actually has a um, high pass filter on it which uh, knocks out all low frequency noise so when I'm driving like this there's lots of low frequency uh, vibration which is coming into the camera and the mic now um, that high pass filter knocks out and cleans up a lot of that uh, low frequency crap so that's very useful to have if you're getting an external uh, video mic definitely now um, the other thing is with mics um, I'm probably going to get one of those wireless uh, wireless mics which you know sit on your um, sit on your shirt those lapel lavalier microphones or whatever they're called um, and I, I'll probably get one of them but um, I generally prefer my shotgun video mic for audio now when I um, the Senyo Exacti stores what I do is I film in uh, high definition 1280 by 720 uh, 30 frames per second the camera with um, which uh, I think is about six megabits per second um, which it stores on the video card I've got an 8 um, which stores on the SD card I've got an 8 gigabyte SD card in there and that stores about two hours of that um, HD video now the camera is capable of quite a lot more than that it's capable of full HD uh, uh, 1920 by 1280 at 60 frames per second it's capable of so it's a, it's a very schmick um, very schmick camera but um, I you know just for just for YouTube and blogging I don't see the need to film at full you know, absolute full HD I think that's a bit silly so I stick to 1280 by 720 which is what YouTube recommend as a minimum uh, HD format now um, yeah so I film in HD um, straight to SD card now if you've been watching the blog for a while you know that I started off with a crappy 320 by 240 uh, webcam which was absolutely atrocious don't use a webcam if you're going to do a uh, video blog of any sort um, and then I switched to my DV camera which I had my PAL um, 
720 by 576 um, tape, uh, DV tape camcorder. I used that for quite a while and I experimented with both widescreen and 4.3 format, but widescreen didn't work uh, properly because it actually formatted, it fitted, it just put the black bars top and bottom so when you converted that, when you loaded that into YouTube and stuff like that, you get black bars side and top and it was just it was just pretty crap. Um, I had to post do a secondary post process on that to get rid of those black bars, that was horrible. So I switched back to 4.3 I think at one stage. Anyway, around about blog 30-ish or something, I got this HD or 50, I don't know, I can't remember, so long ago. I got um, this new HD camcorder, so now I film in HD. Now that has created, filming in HD has created quite a few issues because um, it stores the HD on the card in H.264 um, video format. Now my editing software I use, Ulead Video Studio 12, it can read uh, the H.264 um, straight out. I don't have to convert it at all, which is great. But the thing with um, uh, H.264 or MPEG-4 video is that it's very, very difficult to actually edit that frame by frame um, because it's a continual. It, it's just uh, it's just the way the codecs work and stuff like that. There really isn't, um, you know, the codec technology for decoding MPEG-4 frame by frame hasn't really matured yet. So it's um, I went from because um, my old DV tape camcorder filmed in MPEG-2. Now that worked seamlessly. I load that into my edit software and for each clip I trim. What I do is uh, for each clip, stop, start, I film something, start, I film something, then I stop. And for each one of those it saves as a separate file. I load all the files in and then I trim each one, the front and the back. And you know, you've got to slide that little slider bar um, uh, you know, fairly accurately, you know, often frame by frame. Um, and that works seamlessly and quick and seamlessly on MPEG with MPEG-2 files. But MPEG-4 was slow as a wet week. Absolutely terrible. And um, even on a video, um, I joined a video bloggers forum and everyone told me that I was absolutely crazy, insane for trying to edit MPEG-4 directly in my edit software. What everyone does is typically, what I was told, you're supposed to convert it first to MPEG-2 and then do your edits and then re... Well, I didn't want that extra step. That was stupid. So I finally um, figured a out, out a way with Ulead Video Studio to kind of um, edit MPEG-4 in with reasonable responsiveness. I just, um, I turned the cache off or whatever that was creating a few problems and it turns out it's not bad but it's still quite slow to edit each clip and sometimes you have to do it frame by frame because if I want to chop out a word or something like that if I want to stop it right there and I continue talking in the clip I've got to stop it right between you know two syllables or you know two words and that requires you to go into the frame and that's that actually takes a bit of effort now um, my last blog for example the huge 51-minute uh, one that I um, I did on uh, on designing the microcurrent. Now that had um, I think 68 different filmed segments in it. So I stop started uh, 68 times, and I used almost every one of them. I think there's only a couple that I actually threw out uh, from editing that. Now each one of those had to be edited start and end, often frame by frame, and that. That took quite a few hours, let me tell you. Um, so really, uh, like filming filming that blog took just, you know, it, it, I had 51 minutes worth of end footage. It probably took me an hour and a half to film that. Um, now, uh, but then it took me at least probably double that to edit the damn thing. Um, and then, okay, once I finished uh, editing in Ulead Video Studio, I output it, I actually output it in MPEG-2 um, in 1280 by 720 because MPEG, uh, because Ulead Video Studio does not have a 1280 by 720 MPEG-4 output format. So, <laughs> so I, um, it's all very, uh, it's all very confusing, but I output in MPEG-2, 1280 by 720, 30 frames per second, 
uh, sorry, 25 frames per second. Um, so the frame rates actually dropped because once again, U lead doesn't have an option there for 30. Uh, and so that creates a huge file, often, uh, you know, four or five gigabytes in size. It's, it's massive. Um, and that takes about, that can take like up to an hour to actually render that. From when I press start, and it starts rendering, it does it frame by frame, that can take about an hour um, for, for a decent, you know, for a quite a large blog. And, uh, but the good thing is that I can do things in the background while that's going on, so it doesn't lock up the machine or anything, so I just set that and go. Now, the, uh, once I've done that, I've got the MPEG-2, I put it into a program called Handbrake. Um, it's a free conver MPEG-4 conversion program, um, it's really very nice. I highly recommend you get it. Um, it's free and it converts the MPEG-2 into both the, MP the HD MPEG-4, 1280 by 720 MPEG-4, and also the 480 by 272 um, iTunes uh, slash podcast version. Um, I used to do the podcast version in 320 by 240, but now I've upped it to 480 by 272 because I believe that's the... Res recommended resolution for the new iTouch and stuff like that. So um, hopefully if you're watching on the iPhone or the iTouch um, or even bloody the iPad today I guess, I hope you appreciate the increased resolution. Um, once again, using Handbrake I set, um, what I do is I set a constant bit rate. Now for the HD format, 1280 by 720, 25 frames per second, I choose a 2000 uh, bits per second um, sorry, 2000 K bits per second uh, frame rate, um, sorry, bit rate. Um, so two meg bits per second constant frame rate. Uh, I, found, I find that's a reasonably good compromise between file size and, um, and video quality. Now for the iTunes one, I, um, I have been, I started out using 300 K bits per second or 0.3 megabits Per second, uh, but I found that was cr creating files too big. And the um, then I started using 250 K bits for a while. And the last one I actually used, the big 51 minute one, I actually used 200 uh, K bits per second, constant bit rate. And I thought that was um, still quite reasonable quality. So I might keep it at 200. So it's an order of magnitude lower than the HD one at two megabits per second. So. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, once, once the uh, HD, once I've rendered both of those, I've got the MPEG-4 HD and the MPEG-4 podcast. I FTP the podcast version directly onto my server, EEV blog slash video. So if you're absolutely desperate and you want the super duper latest version first before anyone else, keep a watch on that directory and you might see it pop up and you'll see it before anyone else gets it um, if you're that desperate but really if you're that desperate and you're constantly watching a directory on my website well yeah, find a better hobby I think um, anyway I, that's what I do I upload that first and then I upload the I start the upload of the HD version to YouTube now YouTube have um, a change oh, actually I'll go into the changes later anyway I upload the uh, HD version to YouTube and now I start uploading and that comes up with a progress bar and that can take an hour for a big one or half an hour or something like that um, and then what it does after that after it's uploaded is it goes through frame by frame and it and it checks it and it puts it and it processes it into a real low quality crap version now YouTube has got a bug in the system. When I upload the video, I set a, there's a bit in there that you can, there's a button you can, option you can set in there called, um, you can set it to private so nobody can see it until you decide to make it public. Now I set that because I want to wait until YouTube is finished processing and the full quality version is up before people see it. But there's a bug on YouTube that when it's finished that frame by frame processing, regardless if I've set that privacy bit, it reverts, it makes it public. And if I don't catch it in time, um, you know, 50 people, 100 people have already watched it, and then I've got emails complaining about the shit video quality. Well, God. Um, 
they just keep coming. People don't learn that YouTube needs time to process video. And I'm sorry if you actually get that. It's not my fault. It's actually a YouTube bug and I, I don't know any way to get around it. So if you do, let me know, please. Um, so, and, and it should say up the top, of, if, you, if you watch my video on YouTube, it should say up the top, if it does say up the top, uh, this video is still being processed um, and image quality may, be, may improve once you finish processing, then I recommend you probably don't watch it, just wait for a little bit until it finishes processing um, and, then, and then you can watch it in the best quality. Now, um, and, but um, it, YouTube does actually seem to be quite, after it's finished that crap quality version, it seems to produce quite a good quality version, but it still hasn't finished processing. So there is, is an intermediate version there that's perfectly um, watchable. In fact, you don't know the difference from the full one unless you view it in full HD. Uh, anyway, and then for each video I, I upload, because I'm a YouTube partner and I get ad revenue, um, which is really great, by the way. Um, I uh, there, for each video you upload, you have to you have to fill out a little form that says you have to tick all these boxes saying yes or no. It does your video contain copyright content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's a pain in the ass. And you have to do that for every video. Then you've got to explain with your type in text, explaining what your video is, and that you own all the rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why I don't have any copyrighted music and that's why I don't have any music on there anymore because I have to tick if you tick yes to any of those boxes then it has to be vetted by a by a human at YouTube and it's just really really annoying they do it for every video you upload it's painful um, anyway once YouTube is finished uploading I uh, finish processing to a reasonable quality then I will post a um, I will create a new blog post on the eevblog.com WordPress site because I use WordPress with a PodPress plugin if you're interested in that that's what I use for the i that creates the iTunes compatible formats um, and header files and all that sort of rubbish I don't know the details of it but it works uh, and um, yeah so I create a new post I copy and paste the embedded YouTube uh, link in there so the video you watch on my website um, if you go to evblog.com and watch the embedded video, that's not hosted on my site. That's a standard embedded YouTube video, so it doesn't waste my server bandwidth, which is really good. Because um, in theory, I have unlimited bandwidth, but um, I do. But I am running my whole site and half a dozen other sites on the one shared server, so it's not um, it's not that great. But it seems to be able to handle in the streaming. Um, iPod videos which are hosted on um, straight on my server uh, and well that is probably the process so you know a, a blog which takes me um, 10 minutes to film or you know 10 minutes to film can can take and you know oh, sometimes an hour or two to edit and then the conversions and uploads and then post on the blog there's, there's actually quite a bit of work that goes into posting each episode. And the reason I like these drive time ramp ones is because there's one continuous video clip. So all I've got to do is drop into the my timeline. I've got to drop the intro, the ending, and just this one video clip, trim the start and the end, boom, and I can um, edit one of those in you know 10 minutes. It's really, it's really quite quick. So there you go. That's my process. I've probably left something out, but uh, hope you gives that bit of a background and I'll see you next time.